Hey, welcome everybody. We've got uh, Naomi Wolf coming back today. She, of course, is a best-selling author, professor, uh, influential feminist writer from back, uh, also a Rhodes Scholar, graduate of Yale, doctorate from Oxford. Uh, best-selling works include The Beauty Myth. That's the one that she is most noted for. Give Me Liberty and The End of America. More recently, co-founder and CEO of civic tech company Daily Clout. Uh, there's the... Un is this another one, Facing the Beast? Did I not put That's that one the in there? one. Her uh, latest book. Uh, the latest one. She's uh, very prolific. All right. There's uh, Courage, Faith, and Resistance in a New Dark Age. We'll, we'll get into that and more. We're watching you, of course, on the Restream and over at the Rumble Rants. Appreciate you all being here. We'll get to it in just a second. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Are you one of the millions of American women and men dealing with premature hair thinning and hair loss? Or maybe you're scared about inheriting that thinning look because it runs in your family? Start 2024 with a real solution that delivers results without the harsh side effects or unwanted chemicals and no need for prescription. Provia uses a safe natural ingredient, Procapil, to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and hair loss. By supporting healthy scalp circulation, the delivery of nourishing nutrients, and healthy hair follicle anchoring to your scalp, Provia guarantees more hair on your head than in the shower or on your comb. Right now, new customers save over 50% plus free shipping. Every introductory package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia serum for daily use, plus the Provia Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. Don't wait. Order now to save an extra 10% and get free shipping at ProviaHair.com forward slash Drew. That's P-R-O-V-I-A-H-A-I-R, ProviaHair.com slash D-R-E-W. Hey, Caleb, while I'm giving more of Naomi's particulars, maybe you could throw up our upcoming schedule. You can follow Naomi at DailyClout.io, also on X, Naomi R. Wolf. And uh, let's see that schedule if you've got that. Uh, upcoming, Stanhope and his wife Bingo in here tomorrow. Jim Brewer the next day. We're going with the comedians for a couple of days. Then Joseph Latipo comes back really soon. Roseanne, Alex Berenson, and uh, people keep asking about Dr. Kelly Victory. She is fine, and she is returning on Valentine's Day, as is Alex Berenson as, at that time. If you guys have suggestions of people you'd like to see us interview, you'd like to hear from on this program, uh, set it up at just let us hear from you at contact at drdrew.com. Susan is the one checking all that stuff out. As I said, uh, Naomi Facing the Beast, Courage, Faith, and Resistance in a New Dark Age, just the latest book. She is uh, recognized as a femi influential feminist writer back since being a Rhodes Scholar, Yale University, doctor from Oxford, and the beauty myth being a foundational document uh, that she produced. And she has some new data she wants to go over, but I got a lot of things I want to talk to Naomi about. So please welcome Naomi Wolf. Hey, Thank welcome you so back. much for having me. Thank you so much for having me back, Dr. Drew. Of course. So Naomi, I want to, I want to, before we get into the new data you've had lately, I, I want to walk down a couple of roads with you uh, just to, to set this all up. People seem confused about who you are and what your training is. So let's just get that out there. What, what was your degree at Oxford? Well, let me first say I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> I mean, that's right. My bio. And, and I, I want to, and, you, and you're not a, you're not a, not a biologist, not a medical doctor, not a medical researcher, but right. you're a writer. Yeah. You're a writer, right? Yes. And you have had, and you're a, a researcher of sorts, correct? I mean, you're used to pouring through a lot of research to do your writing. Sure, of course. I mean, I'm a nonfiction writer. Um, my focus has been women's issues, including medical issues. I wrote a book about childbirth in America. I wrote a book about eating disorders, um, breast implants, cosmetic surgery from a medical perspective. And uh, I wrote a, a book about female sexuality. Um, and so I'm, all, I'm, I'm often focused on women's health issues. Uh, but I'm also focused on civil liberties and the rule of law and democracy and freedom. So a lot of my other books have to do with 
um, you know, the threat to liberty uh, that I began worrying about actually in 2007 with my book, The End of America. And the last two books I wrote um, have been about what I see as a kind of global coup um, using public health as a pretext. But let me speak to what I think um, you may be asking, if I may. Um, right now, I'm heavily involved in research, um, but this is the role I play. I oversee in my company um, a, a project uh, but it's actually under the leadership day to day of my extraordinary COO, Amy Kelly, who's project director. And <clears throat> she's a Six Sigma project manager. And she is overseeing six groups of what amount to 3,250 doctors and scientists and biostatisticians and medical fraud investigators, RNs, um, pharmacists, people from many, many backgrounds related to um, healthcare research. And they are going over the Pfizer documents, the 450,000 documents released under court order. And they have produced now 94 reports, which are all up on our website. You can order them in a book form. And when I bring um, findings about the Pfizer documents to the world, which I've been doing for the last two years, I'm literally the messenger for their reports. I'm helping, I help them to write them in a way that everyone will understand. That's my talent. And then I explain what they found to the world. And then do you give an opportunity for feedback or, you know, like, like a peer review kind of process? I mean, the sort of the back and forth that normally goes on with uh, scientific publication. Is, is that part of the process or is that done before you push it out? Well, the group themselves um, have a process of verification, of course. And in now about 700 pages of reports, I think they've made one mistake, which we immediately publicly corrected. Um, but I'm proud to say that they've also had their findings published in a peer-reviewed journal. In fact, they they found a very important, huge story, which was that Pfizer had delayed reporting deaths of eight um, people uh, who died after having been injected with the vaccine, and they delayed unlawfully so as to get their emergency use authorization. They hid the deaths. And if they hadn't hid the deaths, um, they would not have gotten the emergency use authorization. So that's a, a very mm. big bombshell finding. And it was, um, it was, it was published in peer review publication. And then the Epic Times covered that. So that's, and of course, they want to continue to submit to peer reviewed publications. Um, but that's the nature of what they're producing at this point. Is there anything they've, they've, that they have known? When you said they got one thing wrong, well, maybe we ought to put that out there. What was that? Sure. Um, so one of the volunteers analyzed a table and thought that there was a 44% um, miscarriage or spontaneous abortion rate in one section of the documents. And mm -hmm. in fact, she made a mistake in her math, but the true number was over 80%. And I think people would understand you're worrying about uh, freedoms of various type in our current era. What were you seeing in 2007 that got you worked up? I, I, was, I was blissfully ignorant at that point. <laughs> Those were the days, right? <laughs> Before we knew um, how deep the rot could go. Uh, well, I guess I, you know, I'm blessed and cursed. Um, to be very alert to the signs of impending fascism because I've read a lot of history um, because of my training as a, a English literature scholar. You literally read back memoirs and diaries and journals for 400 or 500 years, um, in at least in Britain and America and Western Europe. And so I, I was aware because of my reading how easily and how quickly um, fragile democracies like Germany in the 30s, for instance, or Italy in the 20s could descend into fascism. Um, you know, reading Orwell, reading, um, you know, books like Victor Klemper, I will bear witness just day to day observing, you know, a Jewish uh, literature professor, um, observing day to day the changes around him as the, as the Nazis uh, came to power. But I also, um, for my book, The End of America, I, looked systematically at times and places in history in which fragile democracies got overthrown or subverted and became uh, fascist or totalitarian dictatorships. And as a result of that study, I identified 10 steps 
that fascists or tyrants always take um, in that process. And I realized um, that we were moving along that process even in 2007. So for instance, that was the Bush era, but it carried on into the Obama era. And I was one of like maybe six liberals um, in the Obama years, you know, continuing to try to warn people about this. But for example, I mean, we, you know, Bush Jr. wanted to have a gulag in Guantanamo beyond the rule of law. He wanted to hold people without charge of trial. He was targeting um, critics. Uh, he had kind of an enemies list. Um, he wanted to torture people um, unlawfully. He was justifying torture. Um, he wanted to create a surveillance society. Uh, the Espionage Act, you know, all the, all the, the, you know, the, the reviving of the Espionage Act targeting um, Julian Assange, the Patriot Act, which was ushered in, of course, after 9-11. Um, all of those um, bills were very much like the Enabling Acts in 1933 that gave the state powers to, you know, minutely surveil civil society and, and free citizens. Um, he was all about that. And, uh, and, and he he wanted to create a situation called the global war on terror in which normal checks and balances of our laws did not apply. Well, that's step 10, which is martial law or emergency law. So as a result of having written that book and then Obama carrying it on with like droning American citizens um, and, you know, building out Guantanamo instead of closing it, uh, this just this trend just continued. And then it's escalated, of course, in the last four years dramatically. Do you, you know you I think you use the word tyrants use these 10 steps it it feels like we have rolled down this path sort of synthetically I, I not like you know without some uh, f uh individual mind behind it it's just oh we had a terror attack we got to do something and then we got to do this and it's just these reactions that occur then it seems like when somebody not so good steps in, you got a bunch of problems. Yeah, I I really appreciate that you've noticed that because um, I often say history is not moving organically right now. And, you know, what you just described is the way history usually moves. It's like a person, a leader emerges, a popular sentiment comes to the fore. It's unpredictable, but that's not where we're at right now. For sure, there's a program. I mean, you saw it rolled out around the world, and this is the subject of my last two books, you know, but especially Face and Beast, um, my latest book, all around the world, at all at the same time, there was emergency law, which is step 10, as I mentioned. All around the world, there were um, efforts to surveil people, uh, the vaccine passport being one of the uh, sneakiest um, efforts that were underway. Um, but, you know, central bank digital currency and digital ID are also new ways to surveil people. All around the world, you saw restrictions on what had been previous guarantees of human autonomy, autonomy, which is informed consent, medical freedom. That's been the law around the world since the Nuremberg trials. The Nuremberg Code, you know, guarantees informed consent. That was withdrawn. Um, you saw but here in New York State, where I'm, you know, from where I'm broadcasting, our governor, Kathy Hochul, keeps trying to, you know, pass regulations to build quarantine camps. And I've read the regulations. There are similar regulations they're trying to push through in Washington State, where you can be held if you've been exposed to a bloodborne pathogen. And there's no judicial review. There's really no way you can get yourself out, not even good behavior or showing that you're not infected. Um, and they can... It, you know, this was appealed by Bobby Ann Cox, a lawyer, and she just kept going. She's, you know, she's fighting the appeal. So she's determined to open quarantine camps. And in Australia, they have quarantine camps where people, including senators, are, you know, held. And in China, they have quarantine camps where people kind of get disappeared. Um, so this is all rolling out all at the same time. I mean, I could go on and on. Mandates, that's not even a law. You know, the president doesn't have the power to um, declare that people can lose their jobs if they don't take something into their bodies. But we saw that, you know, a mandate isn't a law. It's not part of our system of laws, you know, our, our, our democracy. It's, yeah. a, it's what tyrants do. They mandate what, what they want their right. outcome to be. And so let me let me dial back a little bit and um, talk about the fact that you said that this is not the normal sort of way history unfolds. Are though are there other periods that have unfolded in a similar fashion? Because I 
I've been I've been preoccupied with a model lately. But what is your position on that? Well, that's really interesting. That's that's very much the important question to ask. You know, people have been conditioned, if they, and and usually good people, polite people, to say something like, "Well, I really don't want to trivialize the Holocaust by comparing these times to that." But, and honestly, as a deep student of the Holocaust, and you know, descendant of a woman who lost nine brothers and sisters in the Holocaust. Those are, that's so much is parallel to that time. So much is parallel. Um, one really, it, so much so that, um, and I, I pointed this out in, you know, even going back to uh, the end of America, so much so that the people who are orchestrating history right now have read the history of the Nazis' ascent to power, for sure. Because for instance, it's not well known. Um, they're reprising certain things that worked really well at that time. Um, one thing they're reprising, well, you know, there, there were health passports at that time, um, you know, that, that created a surveillance society. But also one of the first ways that um, Nazi ideology, even before 1933, when the Nazis officially were the majority in parliament, they um, weaponized public health. And they specifically weaponized doctors and professional medical organizations so that if you aligned with um, National Socialist ideology as a physician, you did much better, you got perks, you got sinecures, you got advanced, you, you, you know, money flowed your way. And if you challenged the rising ideology of National Socialism, you got marginalized, it was difficult to practice. Um, you know, exactly what we're seeing now. And using doctors who were thus kind of lulled into and flattered into being the um, advanced tip of the spear, right, for this ideology. And it, it had beautiful language. It was like, you know, social hygiene and social purity and social cleanliness. Of course, people like us of our descent were the infection, you know, we were the infections, right? The, there was this discourse of, of, of infectious disease and Jews and homosexuals and, um, you know, disabled people were were a cancer or an infection on the pure Aryan um, body of society. Um, what what then happened was that they were doctors were tasked with um, identifying life unworthy of life or useless eaters, and this was way before the death camps. This was death camps were like 1941 to 1945. This was I, like 1930 you know, before that, 1933. But I. But you had said that there is not necessarily, well, I, I was saying we'd sort of fumbled our way into this current situation. And that suggests to me that it was just people reacting rather than people planning. And to me, the, the French Revolution was a little closer to all that, hmm. where there was I just see. one thing, then another thing, and another thing, and then, oh my goodness, another thing, and then they go too far, and then they backlash, and they go too far right. again, and they bring out the guillotine. It just, it just rolled. It rolled and I rolled see. and rolled, and it kept I rolling. See. And, and yeah. I, I don't know, this feels more like that. I, I do, though, worry, you, I know you see sinister intent here and there, the, certainly the World Health Organization and their grab at power is gravely, gravely conserving. T talk to me about that. Yeah. Um, I definitely misunderstood what you said then because um, I thought you were seeing a kind of a synchronicity. And just the last thing I did want to mention about m my view in contrast that this is quite or orchestrated is the role of AI, which makes yeah. it possible to yeah. roll things out in a more holistic way. Well, you're, you know, you're, I don't think you can be paranoid enough when it comes to the World Health Organization. <laughs> I mean, I've been, you know, I've been raising these alarms based on my reading of, of fascism introducing itself for two years now. And literally every single thing I've predicted has come true. And I'm not proud of that. It's just that it's a very predictable map that these people use in order to get where they want to go. So, um, the World Health Organization, of course, has this treaty, which I guess in the UK they're calling an accord, which is a friendlier word. And it basically drains sovereignty of every signatory nation. And of course, I think we've yeah. talked about this or I've talked about it many places. Once you no longer have sovereignty, anything can be done to you. You're really not a citizen anymore. You have no rights as a citizen. And if the World Health Organization says there's disease X, 
And I think it's so fascinating that and predictable, again, that there's this drumbeat from Davos of disease X. We need the pandemic accord, accord for disease X. Disease X can be anything. If there's a, a flare up of Ebola, yeah. disease X. If there's tuberculosis, disease X. Um, but they can de- declare it. And they were very good at declaring things that proved to be unverifiable in the last pandemic and tell us that it's too dangerous to go outside. So once again, we'll be dependent on digital media for or any sense of reality. Um, and then they'll just zip through the, the treaty. And once that happens, it, it can be mercenaries from the WHO, you know, patrolling our streets or arresting us for, you know, exposure to a bloodborne pathogen or for our thought crimes or for, you know, being insufficiently respectful of public health demands. Um, I notice, uh, I notice a, another, uh, another, direction they seem to be going they, at the world economic forum today there was a guy lectured on the need for international coordination on co2 lim- limits and i thought oh they, all they have to do is declare that a health problem and done and okay. done and they have full sovereign authority over everybody at that point uh, and so Absolutely. it's and then they want to get rid of coffee they want to get rid of coffee and meat and all kinds of things and yes. it, oh yeah coffee was the, a target yesterday and it's it just uh I, I, no, Susan's, Susan's offended now. Now she's worried. Uh, not my coffee. <laughs> and yeah, it, it is, I, again, the more centralized, the more potential for shenanigans. I, I, I just am very, very worried about that trend, especially in medicine where the, the only efficient unit, I say it over and over, is the patient physician. That's your unit. Anything you put on top of that is an inefficiency and an adulteration. So uh, you've got some new data, uh, and let's kind of go through that if you're if you're ready for it. It was, sure. uh, it, it, it's concern. This is out out of the Pfizer system, or is this out of VAERS? Uh, I think what you're talking about today is the article we published. Ask why 429 moms died, and um, that came out mm-hmm. on January 18th of this year. And that's actually written by Dr. Pierre Corey and Mary Beth. Pfeiffer. And we republished it and they interviewed our volunteers um, for some of the uh, argument that they made. Um, Yeah. And so what they found, and this is a very concerning chart here. I don't know if uh, your producer has Mm -hmm. it. You can see it pretty well. We we, 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 we do. We have a full group. Yeah. So So that was uh, early 21, right? Right. And that's very weird. And where was that in one locality? Um. Well, this is yeah. this is CDC wonder. Uh, so it's all of the United States. U.S. maternal deaths are on a worry, mm. worrisome trajectory, said the AMA. Um, pregnancy-related deaths soared 40% in 2021, and we haven't seen maternal deaths of that scale since 1965. Um, and the CDC, according to these authors, left out the crucial context, and they analyzed 1,205 mothers who died in or within 42 days of pregnancy Mm -hmm. in 2021. So 429 had COVID-19 on the death certificate as either the primary or contributing Mm -hmm. cause, which is a 321% increase in COVID pregnancy deaths from the year before. So what these authors argue is that they're suggesting that um, COVID didn't just drive these pregnancy deaths but rather the campaign to vaccinate pregnant women in the heat of the second COVID wave may have combined to make infections worse in the vaccinated. The phenomenon often minimized as, quote, breakthrough infection is called vaccine-associated enhanced disease or VAID, V-A-E-D, and it's been documented in other diseases. Okay. Uh, so that's their argument. I would, I would add to that, you know, again, not being a medical doctor, you know, what I've learned and what I discussed on your show in the previous clip, that um, in vaccinated women, there are, we've now seen problems with um, placentas. And when you've got problems with your placenta, when it's not intact, when it's uh, compromised with calcifications, as Dr. Thorpe has shown with his sonograms, and we independently confirmed with two separate midwives at two separate um, birthing centers, that is a condition, of course, you know, that takes you back to pre-modern childbirth in which there are things like hemorrhages um, and and uh, and ruptures, you know, in the course of delivering your baby or or the placenta not right. being fully, fully delivered. 
So I, I want to get back to the study that Pierre Corey put out there. So, so the implication is it's COVID plus vaccine that caused those deaths, right? That, that's what and, and they do we are have arguing. Vaccine? Okay, and do we have vaccine status on those women? Is that is that documented? Yes. Well, they found that I believe forty eight percent of them had been vaccinated. Huh. So it's so half more than four hundred women, right? Uh, less, a little less than half. Half vaccinated. And half and not this is, I mean, of, of the, of, uh, of the, of the group women that, that died, died, right? Of the women that correct of the group of the that women died. that died, yeah. Which huh. was again, you know, multiples the usual number of women who died from pregnancy. So another. Did, did we have? Sorry. Go ahead, finish your thought. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I just want to put it in context that women, and this is like it's going to go down in history as one of the great crimes of this time. Pregnant women were vaccinated in 2021 into 2022 in a massive propaganda campaign, including payments to um, the uh, uh, professional organizations that um, oversaw obstetricians and gynecologists. However, there were no studies on pregnant women showing it was safe. Um, Pregnant women were excluded from the COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials, and this data to date on safety of COVID-19 vaccines in pregnancy is limited, said the CDC. And this is them proposing to monitor safety reads from June of 2021. This is the CDC saying there is, quote, an urgent need for outcome data following, emphasis added, use of COVID-19 vaccines in pregnant populations. So these moms died before there were studies showing that this injection was safe in pregnant women. And I just want to stress again, in the Pfizer documents, there's abundant evidence, more of it came out even since I last spoke to you about this evidence, that the vaccine is incredibly unsafe for pregnant women and fetuses. In fact, in a report that I haven't had a chance to tell you about because we found it after our last show, in which I described this, um, an eight-page report about pregnancy and lactation, two babies died in utero. And the uh, <laughs> Pfizer documents describe that as due to, quote, maternal exposure to the vaccine. So they concluded that the vaccine killed mm. those babies. Pfizer did. And, and, yeah. when you, and when you bring that data up, do they, have you brought it up to the FDA? Have you brought it up to anybody that uh, can, and, what, and what's the response? Well, um, we have asked the Justice Department through our lawyers to open a criminal investigation, and there's been silence. Um, we've given all of the data to our lawyers to send to the Justice Department. They have it. Um, we have handed all our evidence to Ken Paxton, the Attorney General in Texas, who's suing Pfizer. Um, I hope he's making good use of it. Um, we, uh, oh, our volunteers have written to the FDA and not had satisfactory responses of any kind. Um, and well, I guess one response, when we broke the story about the CDC, Dr. Walensky and the FDA uh, receiving this eight page report showing that babies had died and that there was a table of sick babies because they knew that the um, mRNA and spike protein and lipid nanoparticles were in breast milk and making babies sick. And there was this table, a pregnancy and lactation report and they sent this uh, summary and babies were like vomiting and they had edema, which is their flesh was swelling. They had convulsions. One baby in the Pfizer documents died of multi-system organ failure from nursing a vaccinated mom. Um, when this eight-page report mm -hmm. of the horrors went to the CDC and we were on War Room talking about it, three days later, Dr. Walensky resigned. Hmm. Interesting. Has Joseph, have you made contact with Joseph Freeman at all? Because he's the one, he actually has had phone conversations with the FDA and they've been pretty sort of astonishing. And uh, what are they he, saying? he um, well, he has a study, you know, he has a group together uh, that is looking into the data and has pulled out some stuff that is concerning. And uh, he, the one of the doctors was a pediatric rheumatologist who'd had a kid die, a five year old die just a few days after vaccine and he'd reported it to the FDA and they didn't respond. 
And their re reaction was, as opposed to saying, oh my God, there's something terribly wrong. We have to get to the bottom of this. They went, yeah, I must have fallen through the cracks. We don't, we don't, eh, we, you know, we should get, kind of get to that. It, it, we tend to get to the young kids dying uh, quickly. <laughs> it's, it, it's something's um, um, run amok. <laughs> something is not quite right. Um, it, it may not be as bad as you think it is, but but something doesn't seem right. Uh, there, oh, there's a lot this of is, this is as as bad. I mean, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Doctor Drew, but um, anytime there's like I want to believe. For a long time, I wanted to believe this was just a greedy corporation or busy bureaucrats, and they just didn't know. But the, these charts, I mean, you know, I described this chart of thousands of women having horrific menstrual problems, you know, 15,000 women bleeding every day, 10,000 women bleeding twice a month, um, 8,000 women hemorrhaging, you know, 5,000 women having no periods at all, meaning they're infertile. This is a, a you know, a chart, just like the sick babies chart. And, it, you know, yeah. they, they fully documented these horrors, the way they were ruining women and babies. Um, and they were looking into them. I mean, something right. else that happened since we last spoke, if, if I may, is that, um, one of our lawyers, Ed Berkovich, FOIA, meaning submitted a Freedom of Information Act demand to the CDC for emails about myocarditis. And we found from the results that Dr. Walensky, Dr. Fauci, the head of the FDA, the White House, 15 communications operatives in the White House in a template well. to surface this up to the president, uh, were hiding the fact that the Israeli Ministry of Health and pediatricians had told them that they were seeing minors sustaining heart damage, myocarditis, from the vaccine. And instead of, and this is April of 2021, instead of telling Americans and stopping right then, they had a high level freak out meeting to create a script, which is 17 pages completely redacted, to lie about minimizing cover up myocarditis in teens. And you'll remember that for the rest of 2021, there was a giant propaganda push to get your teenager and young adult vaccinated. That's the part that is so mysterious to me. Uh, the uh, we're gonna I'm gonna play for you when we get back from a little break here, Dr. Freeman and his call to the FDA, so you can get a sense of what that was like. But the the pushing of this, I, there's so many things that to me should be done. A maybe some vaccines directed towards the whole virus as an option. So doctors can give patients options and not uh, and talk about informed consent of one kind versus another. What about uh, not vaccinating young people who are at no risk and talking about the maybe one in ten thousand risk of myocarditis versus one in almost zero risk of the of the illness itself? Uh, how about the rest of the world is not vaccinating children. <laughs> Why are we doing that? There's just so many. Uh, why not go back and do the research we didn't do during the warp speed period? And I'll show you when doc, what Dr. Freeman was looking at was that these observational studies don't replace real randomized controlled trials. They don't replace it. And you see how confusing it is when you look at these observational data. So, because there's there's always a way to parse the data. You can always, you know, break it down and make it sound worse than it is or better than it is. So let's um, let's take a little break, and we get back. Uh, I'll play Dr. Freeman's, th and and then I want to, I want to, well, I'll do it right now. I, I want to remind everyone that I had to publicly apologize to to Naomi because I I dismissed the the menstruation issue, but but you know what? But it was an important lesson for me in many levels. But one was. Oh, that's how we, my profession, treats women's menstruation. It's like bah, 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 bah. it's like a headache, or no, 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 no. Yeah, we just we make very little of it, very light of it. And you started pointing out how it not just is more than a male can understand; it also is affecting fertility in certain cultures and certain populations, and the ability of intimacy between uh, uh, committed part. All, all this stuff. It had a, it had many, many, many layers to it. And so legitimately, I, you know, you talk about watching your own Eurocentrism, male, male centrism, you, we have to really check ourselves uh, when, when we're medicine, particularly, because we have a long history of marginalizing yeah. women's issues. So go okay. ahead. That was more doctor centrism. No, I was just going to say. 
that was more yeah. doctor centrism yeah. than male centrism, I would say. But Dr. Drew, I just yeah. want to yeah, like yeah. Val- yeah. validate and compliment you. Like the way you behaved in apologizing and taking responsibility for having made a mistake is how everyone in your profession should be behaving right now. And all the scientists who got yeah. it wrong or went along with nonsense and all the leaders who got it wrong and went along with nonsense. Like that's what we should be having. And Face and Beast deals with this. Like that's the appropriate, ethical, responsible grown-up thing to have done. So you cl- you cleaned up your mess and I really respect you for it. Everyone should be following your example. There is, and, and there is a guy I was watching who was making the rounds today on Twitter who was from the Cre- Cleveland Clinic or something and he was apologizing and talking Good. about how his thinking has changed. And yeah, I'm trying to get to, get to interview that guy to see what is on his head, mind. All right, we'll take a little break. Be right back with Dr. Freeman's call with the FDA. I think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner, whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite. You and your family need to be prepared. That's where the wellness company comes in. You know the wellness company. We have their physicians on like Dr. McCullough frequently. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. It's really, it's a safety net. It's an insurance policy yeah, absolutely. that you hope you're not going to need, but if you need it, you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it. Be ready for anything. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z The medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites, To COVID-19, the Wellness Company's medical emergency kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is drdrew.com forward slash TWC to get 10% off today, just click on that link. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make a resolution that's easy to keep and delivers immediately on its promise. With GenuCell Skin Care, you can turn back the clock and look 5, 10, even 15 years younger. And right now, GenuCell Skin Care is celebrating 2024 with its New Year's sales event. Save over 60% off all of our favorite GenuCell products with one of our customized skin care routine packages. Say goodbye to those fine lines in the forehead and run your corner of your eyes. Sagging jawline, dark marks, skin redness, even under eye bags. Leave them in 2023. Genucel works for women and men. It's safe for all skin types and perfect for skin of any age. Plus, with its immediate effects, Genucel promises results that will make you smile, guaranteed, or 100% of your money back. Start your new year look off right with one of our custom Genucel skincare bundles right now at genucel.com slash Drew. Use our special code Drew at checkout for extra savings off your order today. And remember, every order place is automatically upgraded to free shipping. Don't wait. That is genucel.com forward slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. Well, most of my career, I've been urging people to kick habits, change habits. Well, this time, I'd like to suggest getting into the habit of adding Paleo Valley grass-fed bone broth protein to your daily nutrition regimen. Here's CEO Autumn Smith. It's made from cows with 100% grass-fed and finished, and bones. They're bones rather than the hide most Bone broth or collagen powders are made from hides or hooves, but ours is actually made from the bone because it'll contain additional nutrients. Bone broth is a way to bring back those nutrients, those minerals, and there's glucosaminoglycans, and then there's collagen, which helps us prevent wrinkles and joint pain and actually heals our gut. There's, there's gelatin and there's just all of these ingredients that the modern diet has kind of left by the wayside. Susan and I have been mixing the chocolate favorite bone broth literally into our coffee every morning for months. And we've noticed a difference in our energy, appearance of our hair, skin, nails. Susan's particularly very happy with this. The bioavailable protein also helps us feel satiated. That's the part I'm happy with. Paleo Valley bone broth also comes in vanilla and pure unflavored and can easily be added to your coffee, smoothies, yogurt. Go to drdrew.com slash paleo, P-A-L-E-O, for 15% off your first order. Again, that is drdrew.com slash paleo. All right, we're back. We're joined by Naomi Wolf, and we're going to listen to Dr. Freeman's FDA call in just a second. Naomi, welcome back. It, it is interesting how slowly people are beginning to admit some of the excesses of the pandemic. At least we now know, I think the public understands now that the six-foot distancing was completely made up. I mean, just out of thin air. 
the the because the aerosol because it's an aerosol transmitted, not a fluid transmitted virus. More like thirty to sixty feet would be necessary. Ten feet was what was recommended, and apparently a White House flunky said, "No, we can never convince anybody to do ten feet. We'll just go for six. And uh, that's now well established. It's obvious that that was invented from thin air. There's no such thing in any textbook anywhere on earth, particularly for an aerosolized respiratory virus. So that's the kind of thing that people are beginning to find out. It's it'll be interesting to see how far this goes. I mean, how many, uh, yeah, like you said, uh, uh, attempts at apologizing for the excesses. I want to go back and talk about the your concerns about the limitations of freedom in a second but let's go let's go down the road of dr freeman's call at the fda caleb do you have that all set up yeah i have a um, this is just a short segment of it they can see the rest of it on the uh, your youtube channel but this is okay i want to we were okay. challenging them on that if their surveillance it is adequate and one of my co-authors who's a uh, a rheumatologist a pediatric rheumatologist had he had this to say. It's Patrick Whale, and I'm a UCLA pediatric specialist. Um, this is just an end of one, but February 25th, I filed a VAERS report on a seven-year-old patient who had a cardiac arrest following his first um, Pfizer vaccination. It was about 30, 30 hours after he got the vaccine. Um, I didn't receive any follow-up about it. Um, the patient died about eight days later. I submitted another email offering to update the, you know, the report with the death of the patient. Uh, it's been two weeks now. I still haven't heard anything. So I'm wondering if there's more extensive surveillance than just fares based surveillance for cases like this. And I would think that if the death of a seven year old following the vaccine is not, you know, meriting uh, follow up, either the system is totally overwhelmed or there's there's something wrong with the reporting system. And it went on. The, the the FDA guy said essentially, "Well, we'll have to figure. It. We'll have to, we'll take a look at it. Uh, I, something I, fell I through to... the cracks." Yeah, and the, and then the other thing is, the when they do identify a possible vaccine reaction, this group asked, you know, how do you determine whether it's related to the vaccine itself, other than just proximity and time? And their response was, well, "We got a guy. We got a guy that goes out and checks it out, and he decides." Which can you imagine if if this were the Viox data, and they sent a guy out to determine whether Viox was associated with heart disease or not? They would have just, and in particular, if there was any commingling of of uh, influence or priorities with uh, Pfizer at that time, they, the Viox would have had nothing to do with the heart. There's only eight cases of the heart attacks after Viox that right. got the whole medication pulled. There's more here, I guess. Here we but, go. Um, does that does that sound right, Steve? Yeah, but they should be followed up within within a matter of days, actually. So we'll so just just drop me an email um, or Rich, and then we'll follow, we'll send it to our surveillance group. That's our surveillance to make sure that it, it didn't. I got it. Well, it's just it's it's it fall through the cracks. It's, yeah, it's, it, it, it my, my guess is if anything, it's just that they're behind. But I can't believe they're. I, I can't believe something like this would fall through the cracks. You can't believe something would like this. So would, I, it did I, fall I, through the cracks. You just heard about like it. Pointing fingers, but I, I think that the uh, the larger issue is. I, oh, yes. And just to put that, we. Yeah. Can, so. to, that's just one of his. That he had many, many sort of startling observations. That was just one. We're we're gonna take. We're gonna play the whole FDA call one of these days. That that he's he's in Louisiana, so it's, he's able to to record his co phone calls without uh, approvals. And uh, it, he said there was a lot of astonishing stuff in there. And he's been gravely. He's a very smart guy. He's a very careful researcher, and he's been gravely concerned about a lot of things. So it, yeah. there, there's there's reason to be concerned. I the, to me I I. The, where I sort of focus my attention is on these young males. I just don't understand. I haven't seen a young male get really sick from COVID in eight, two years. Uh, they just don't. They just don't have serious. And even when they, there was uh, Alpha and Delta flying around, it was very rare that their COVID was in any way life-threatening or even requiring hospitalization. Though you could still then make the case for vaccination. And now, you know, let's say let's say it's one of thirty thousand risk of myocarditis. Yes, it's a very small risk, but there's no risk of the illness. So to take a small risk when there's no risk makes no sense. 
And we can no longer say that it is to prevent transmission or prevent infectivity or nothing like that. I don't know what it's doing for these young people, and I don't know how to give them informed consent. And now I've got a booster that's been called into question by Austri Austrian data that suggests it might be uh, suppressing immune response as you continue to boost and boost and boost. And the variant for which it is designed in my region were clearly at least four or five variants past that one. So I don't know, I don't understand what I'm doing. And if I don't understand what I'm doing, how can I give informed consent? If I can't be, if I can't figure it out, how can yes. I inform a patient? And I, and I have had patients that went ahead and boosted anyway, and that's fine. That's their prerogative. Uh, they usually will say something like, I, I have no, you know, I have done well with it. I'm fine with it. And I say, fine, that's fine. And, and let's be clear. I, I am no have issue with the, I don't have issue with the mRNA platform. I, I'm vaccinating elderly people for RSV. I think that's a reasonable thing. And I've seen no adverse events from that vaccine. None whatsoever. Uh, and RSV is around and it's a serious illness in some situations, particularly if you're older. So it, it makes sense. And let's say there is risk from that platform. If you're older, that risk starts to make sense, right? Because it's a serious illness we're trying to protect you from. But the, the world of risk reward seems to have become, uh, just the practice of medicine, it seems to have become completely marginalized. You can't give informed consent. You can't do risk reward analysis. Uh, you just have to do what they tell you. And that's great. It's the opposite of practicing medicine. That's gravely, gravely, gravely concerning. Yeah. So let's go back to the topic of, what do we do with the um, the problems you saw back in 2007 that have seemed to have become really uh, quite a bit more pronounced uh, in terms of our loss of freedoms? Uh, just the fact that, you know, Caleb has to throw a disclaimer up just for us having a conversation. You know, I was with I was with uh, RF uh, Bobby Kennedy the other day. And it just every time I'm around him, I just think to myself, my first interview with him at the end of it, he goes, Oh, you are, Drew, you are really courageous to have spoken to me. And I go, I just thought to myself, I don't agree with everything he said, or I don't agree with everything he's, he stands for necessarily. But to be courageous, to have a conversation with somebody, no, that's disgusting. So that that is disgusting. So what, what is that? And what do you think that is? And what do we have to do about that? Well, I think it's staring us in the face what it is, which is, um, you know, this, uh, global policy that is being enacted of censorship, um, marginalization of dissidents, uh, punishing dissidents by delicensing or um, lawfare or other ways, um, you know, threats of the quarantine camps that I've mentioned, um, threats of, uh, well, what, what Susan and you were talking about, you know, this One Health plan, which basically calls everything public health, and then everything can mm -hmm. be controlled by these 10, 10 oligarchs, basically, who, you know, are planning our futures for us and want a feudal, a global feudal system. And very specifically, um, you know, what is it? Why does this continue? As you may know, you know, this is not your way of looking at the world, but it is mine. I come from a political consulting background. Um, this is a bioweapon. You know, the virus was a bioweapon, as we now know, it was, uh, you know, gain of function research, it was probably released from a lab, um, intentionally or not, it was a lab overseen by the People's Liberation Army of China. Um, the vaccine is a bioweapon, I've become persuaded very reluctantly, by looking at how China has an MOU with Pfizer, China has an IP transfer from Pfizer in 2021, per the SEC filings. Uh, China made a billion doses for export, not for use in China. They opened 14 um, plants in Western Europe and first two in the United States and now 11 to distribute um, a basically Chinese owned, manufactured, formulated, packaged, distributed product going into the veins of Americans. So who's getting mandated, who got mandated? Our soldiers, our sailors, our first responders, our entire healthcare um, you know, personnel, uh, our college students, our future, right? Um, in some states, children going to school, everyone that you need to create a, a healthy society or to defend a society um, that is under attack. Didn't, didn't, and, though, didn't, didn't China end up using the, the Moderna vaccine though? Not to my knowledge, they have another vaccine. Hmm. And, and nor, nor the Pfizer, the, the Pfizer vaccine. 
to my knowledge, they the flow that I traced showed that their MOU with Pfizer was for export only and for Western okay. Europe and North America. Um, but I guess more importantly is to understand that these drugs, not just this one, I and mean, this is why I'm doing all these like herbal remedies, you know, investigations. I never want to be in a hospital again. I never want to consult a doctor again and take, you know, Western pharmaceuticals unless it's for like, you know, a, a limb falling off because we can't, what I've seen from the Pfizer documents is that our, our system of getting these into the market is completely corrupt. You know, we happen to have seen the Pfizer documents. What about the blood thinners my mom is on? What about like everything everyone watching is on? The FDA, get, the FDA doesn't look at what it doesn't want to find, right? That's the process. And so here's 450,000 pages. It, it, our, our experts are, are two years later still pouring over them to find out what's in them. The FDA ushered them through in a week. Right. Exactly like the guy on the phone with that poor child. Right. They don't want to look at what they don't want to find. As you mentioned earlier, they construct, you know, clinical trials are constructed. And we've seen so much of this in Pfizer documents to not see a possible bad outcome. So trials will be ended, you know, in two weeks when the problem that is manifesting is going to take a few months to manifest. Right. Or um, funny math or, uh, you know, unblinding the uh, control group. I mean, all kinds of dirty tricks happened to this particular me medicine to get it to market. And it's killing people and it's sterilizing people. And I, I hate to, you know, tear the last shred of innocence from, from your eyes, Dr. Drew, but unfortunately Pfizer concluded a month after rollout into the arms of the public in November of 2020, that the, their own injection did not work to stop COVID. The third most common side effect in the Pfizer documents is COVID. And they, um, their words are vaccine failure and failure of efficacy. So it, it doesn't even have the efficacy that, you know, the cost benefit analysis respectfully that you just did would suggest it doesn't work to stop COVID. And we're seeing that the people are getting COVID are they vaccinated. Yeah, certainly now I, again, yeah, it's, it's people are conflating, you know, a year ago, three years ago. Now these are, these are different clinical circumstances. They're, they're very, very different setting. Um, Caleb, you documented, you've got some documentation there that I guess China did approve some mRNA vaccine. Do you know which one it was in uh, yes. March of 23? Uh, yeah, that's, that's just what I'm reading is that in March of 2023, they did approve an <laughs> mRNA vaccine from another drug maker. But I have, I mean, I haven't even heard anything about this at all. So, I mean, it's, it's fairly recent and they did wait quite a long before they, they started approvals for it. Yeah, I guess again, what I don't know I'm if they used it. To... Or... Right. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is exactly that. I've concluded that it's a bioweapon and that we're under attack for reasons that, you know, my husband and his appearance, as Brian O'Shea has explained to you all that I'm persuaded by. And, and China doesn't attack us in conventional ways that we're used to thinking about when we think about war. So, you know, our energy supply, our food supply, our farmland, our water resources, our cultural institutions, our universities, that's what is being encircled right now. Our, our open borders, 20, 27,000 Chinese nationals, um, in a, you know, flowing in over the border, along with tens of thousands of people that are, um, you know, we, we don't know who they are. We don't know where they're going. I mean, this is all part of a a warfare scenario in an unconventional way. And I guess what I'm saying is, having looked deeply at the Pfizer injection, it's very easy to make these injections more or less lethal. And one way you can tamper with the lethality is um, dosage, with uh, uh, Moderna being more than three, three times as dangerous as Pfizer with 100 micrograms of the active ingredients versus 30 for adults. But another way you can make it more or less lethal is just um, temperature and storage. You remember that there were ultra cold freezers, you know, early on when it was first rolled out. Well, Pfizer changed their directions multiple times about how you store it. Can you leave it out for two hours? Can you leave it out for 12 hours? It basically, you know, it, it's very, it's like six doses per bottle and a special syringe that people couldn't get. So there's all kinds of weird carelessness about the dose and, you know, how you store it. And all of that can affect how, how lethal it is, how damaging. This is a product that's liquid at ultra cold temperatures and then coalesces at room temperature and in the body and clumps, you know, the, 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 um, lipid nanoparticles are an industrial fat, right? I mean, 
That's why I keep saying this is a bioweapon. We're wrong to think of it as a medicine. It's something that is designed to damage. I mean, it's just, there's no way not to conclude from the focus on sterilizing people in the Pfizer documents. It's designed to do just what we're seeing now, which is, um, you know, all those women with ruined menses. Well, two and a half years later, there's a 13 to 20% drop in live births. This is Igor Chudov's research based on government databases in in countries around the world, but especially in the West. There are a million missing babies in Europe. So there's um, geopolitics is going on. Certain countries are being wiped out or disabled, and people are being moved in who have no memory of democracy. And what um, what you ma- what you what's coming up next for your group? Do they have some uh, particular publications coming down the pipe, pipeline? Pardon me. Yes. Mm-hmm. There's, um, they have a, pardon me, it's not COVID, <laughs> it's a cough. <laughs> I'm swallowing the wrong way. Um, some very exciting <clears throat> things are happening. Um, the VAERS, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I can get through this. <laughs> pardon me. The VAERS database, uh, a ruling just forced the CDC to release not just <clears throat> the bullet the bullet points that people checked for responding to mm-hmm. Uh, question, I'm sorry, it's VSAFE is the database, which is like a a routine questionnaire that got sent to vaccinated people, right? And they Mm -hmm. had only released like, you know, do you have fever? Do you have chills? Preset boxes. Well, now they have to release all of the text fields where people who had bad reactions would write in and say, well, actually, you know, my head fell off or, you know, my child died or, you know, less serious things, of course. Um, And that's 7.8 million records. Um, And it's interesting that the CDC wanted to conceal that. They fought to conceal it. It's interesting that they lost. So there's going to be a massive volume of um, Americans telling the CDC what went wrong, you know, that we're going to see in in their own voices. Very moving. And also Canada's um, organization against um, vaccine injury has just asked to partner with our volunteers because they had a successful FOIA and they're releasing a, a massive database which will be able to show temporality in um, deaths and disabilities, which is very important, as you know, for you know surveilling a population. It's been difficult as you said earlier, rightly to say, well, there are all these excess deaths, there are all these new disabilities that Ed Dowd has documented, for instance, without a direct kind of 48 hours injection to heart attack, it's very difficult to firmly attribute those damages to the injection, but this database will allow that kind of um, analysis. So that's exciting. Yeah, I, I still have my the question I started out with a year and a half ago. Is it what's COVID? What's vaccine? What's vaccine plus COVID? N- none of that seems to have been really properly sorted out because everyone's had COVID and everyone's had the vaccine, or maybe not. I mean, maybe certainly everyone's had COVID. I, I've seen recently, by the way, some odd anatomy uh, coronary disease where in young people, and I'm like, well, maybe this is what Asim Malhotra was talking about. Coincidental, possibly. But uh, odd, very odd. Long like lesion, what? single vessel, just Ew. like uh, long vessel, long single vessel. Really, um, uh, you know, usually heart disease, it's sort of scattered around, and there's usually you know one vessel that gets predominant disease relative to the others, or there can be single vessel disease that's relevant, but they're sort of you know there's sort of it's around this is like one lesion long i've never seen anything like that it was just odd 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 and i i don't know what like to make of it along except the heart the, the, like no 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 long? with 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 the, uh, usually within a coronary artery when you get heart disease you get narrowing right you get mm-hmm. you get plaques and narrowing and then eventually the narrowing you know it can, it can be either a short a strip of artery or a or a long strip of artery, but usually it's pretty short. And it, you know, as it narrows down to 90% or below, then it starts mm-hmm. to become significant. This was like most of the artery replaced by a very tight lesion. That's okay. odd if there's not disease elsewhere. That's just very odd. But anyway, that, that's just my thing. I'll, I'll ask cardiologists about that. Um, okay, I, I still, I want to just, before we wrap up, I, wanna, I just want to go back to the historical uh, topic because that, that's your expertise, and, and that's what got you worried, and that's what got you to see things early. Um, 
and I and I'm not sure I got a clear answer from you on, on what we do. I mean, as far as whatever is going on with China, I mean that's overwhelming to me. I can't really do much about that, but I can sort of take care of the homeland, right? We can right, do stuff right. here, and and it seems like there's been an attack on our privileges and civil liberties really by the people who usually have championed protecting them. And right. it's been very hard to understand this kind of flip. It's, it's very weird. It's weird. Uh, and I, I, yeah. I, and I, I have found myself, like I said, studying the French revolution and very, 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 very deeply trying to figure out what's going on and i found it interesting that the french seem to be doing the same thing right now they're sort of re-examining their own heritage and there's been things that they have mm. sort of biases and myths and things that they're sort of re-examining because they're they're worried about things they're worried about their republic they're worried yeah. about their culture and right it is good and it's sort of admirable do we need to have some yeah. sort of similar self-conscious reckoning is it that simple is it just going to the ballot box? How, how do we manage all this? Yeah, well, it's certainly not as simple as just going to the ballot box. I mean, I, I will bet everyone here, you know, money or dinner that there are going to be problems um, with the presidential election. I mean, that's how this stage of history unfolds. And, you know, one possible use of disease X and the pandemic treaty is to um, have an emergency that keeps everyone home and sending in mail-in ballots um, to keep this populist president that the globalists really don't want to have in power uh, from being reelected. Um, and I'm nonpartisan. I'm not endorsing anyone. I'm just observing that, you know, we can count on problems with our elections. Um, you're, you're asking exactly the right questions. Um, I, I do feel hopeful that people are sort of waking up all at once, it seems, and there are populist movements um, all over Western Europe, and I talked to people in Canada and Australia. Can, can, can I? Can I? I want. I want to uh, uh, just stop for a second. The term populism came out of nowhere uh, about four years ago. W what are we even talking? There's, there's two terms that have come. Uh, two terms that have suddenly become commonplace that I'd never heard in my life before. One was Zionism. I mean. Zionism was sort of a sect of a Hungarian, you know, subsect of the religion that included a, a state of Israel, but it was always the religious Zionism that was always referred to. And there was, and the, of course, the the uh, the enemies of that of that project would call would use it as sort of a pejorative, but now it's used as this universal uh, term for support of Israel, which is just weird to me. Mm -hmm. And then populism came out of nowhere. To the closest thing I can get to what they're talking about is just a majority. I mean, it's just, there's a majority of right. people that isn't that, isn't that right. democratic? How is that? What are they it's even democracy, talking about? With exactly. this? So it's, yeah. So what do they, let's stay with populism. What, what, what do you mean when you say populism? Sure. What do you think the average person means when they say that? What does the press mean when they say that? Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I would, I would gently disagree with you that, I think those two words have been kind of re-weaponized recently, but they, they have a pretty long history. I mean, um, Herzog, I believe, um, kind of popularized the idea of a nationalist Zionism at the turn of the last century. And um, he, he, he did. He did. And, and it became this religious subsect Zionist. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a. Israeli was the term for Israeli, not Zionist. Uh, it, you know, it was the, then all of a sudden they become they became conflated about three months ago, or maybe a couple I, of years ago. I actually heard well, it for I mean, the first we, time we, out of a college argue, student's mouth. We could argue about this, but I'm not sure you yeah. you want to use this time to do yeah, that. It's, but, it's not, um, yeah, it's not important. Talk to me about populism. I mean, it's, well, it's but, important. But you're, but you're really populism. onto something with, with populism and how it's being cast. It's being cast as kind of a dirty word when exactly, I mean, there was a populist era um, in the 19th teens in this country. Um, and it was a reform, a time of reform and a time of, you know, enfranchisement, women got the vote, you know, um, it was a re reaction against kind of oligarchical bankster, you know, interests. Um, and so populism was taught to me in high school as a very positive thing. And, you know, again, extending democracy, just as you say, and now it's really always lumped in with like right wing or, you know, white supremacists or nationalist, you know, as if that's a bad thing, but I'm with you. Right. I'm a very like peacenicky person. I'm a very inclusive, anti-racist 
person and I've become a populist. We were, we were you know, liberal. We would have been liberal. Liberal. Totally That's, right. Always totally classical liberal. Thousand, yeah, that was us. Liberal. That was us. But now yeah. embracing yeah. populism and I'm, I'm cheering on these populist movements because right now the world is like the division isn't left or right. The division is these evil sociopathic and we haven't gotten there, but I think also like demonic oligarchs, right? These, this, these dark forces who are globalists and who elites. Want to, elites. Yeah, elites. Very, uh, yeah, but they're more than elites, uh, elites. right? There are, okay. All right. But, but they're like, we, we go ahead. Yeah, 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 hear me, I want to hear you out. Okay. All I'll right. You they're out. not like the elites of old, like the elites of old would at least fight with each other. These guys are like in lockstep, but anyway, there's them as we discussed earlier. And then there's, you know, people thinking, I just want to be French. I want to be Dutch. I want to be American. I want to be Canadian. It's yeah. okay to have borders. It's right. not racist to have borders. Yeah. As I often say, if you don't have borders, you don't have citizens. You don't, and if you don't have citizens, you, you don't have a country. You democracy, you don't have a country. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. those, so what, what do we do? You know, when you said I can take care of the the home front, that's exactly what we need to do, right? You need to know where your food comes from. You need to make friends with a farmer, be part of a, you know, vegetable growing purchasing network, CSA, I think it's called. You need to um, secure your home. I'm afraid you need to learn to shoot, to defend yourself if you ever have to, God forbid. Um, you have to buy a weapon legally and lawfully, you know, to use in self-defense. You have mm -hmm. to you know, get your water supply in a big plastic barrel. You have to get your food supply, your dehydrated food, your canned food. I mean, prepper has so many negative connotations, but those of us who have, well, as you said, with the medical kit, right? Those of us who have enough food, enough water, we know where our, you know, we know where our generator is. We know where to buy a cow. You know, we're in, having good talks with our neighbors. We know what to do if this the, the grid goes down, if the, you know, cyber... Um, access goes down. That's how we'll survive. And more than anything, build up these um, community links that were so destroyed intentionally uh, during the lockdowns. Go to church, go to synagogue, go to mosque, you know, go bowling, go to the PTA, run for a school board, you know, have friends over for potluck. Um, I mean, literally rebuild all of those local, local, local bonds because when people are informed and able to inform each other face to face, and they've secured their food and their health and their, you know, self-defense. I hate to say it, but it's going to come down to that possibly. Um, and also print out all your uh, financial documents because that definitely going to be weirdness with that. Um, then, and get out of debt. I mean, it's really important to, to not have debt because they're going to weaponize debt. Um, know where the title is to your house. Like all of these games are going to be played. And I have not been wrong yet. But if you secure all of that and you build up strong relationships with your neighbors and get all your information from alternative media and support alternative media, right? Withdraw from the legacy media system, which is just going to create fear messages and propaganda, um, then we can have a rebirth of freedom. I, I think I had uh, Brian, your husband, telling me the same thing was that the local practice of democracy was a really important. He was very optimistic, though. I feel like uh, you don't. You're not making me feel optimistic. You're going. Well, I'm, going I'm Jewish. Yeah. I'm Jewish. You're Jewish. We worry. That's how we survive. <laughs> He's Irish. They fight. That's how they survive. <laughs> Different skill sets. Yeah. What is the? Uh, yeah. What is the the line from Phil on the roof? In the meantime, we suffer. We suffer. <laughs> So <laughs> we quit, we quetch. Uh, <laughs> we have, we have, um, well, anxiety. Uh, again, I, 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 I don't know that I'm agreeing with everything, but I, I'm always love the, the thought provocation and, and I, and I Likewise. Uh, appreciate you and I appreciate your writing and I appreciate what you guys are trying to do. It's, it's all, you know, you're coming from the right place, which is, it wouldn't be accurate to say. Uh, wouldn't it be accurate to say, I guess it more properly put, that your pursuit is of the truth, correct? I hope so. I'm a journalist and a nonfiction writer that used to well, be like, but, you but know, listen, journalism 101. But, <laughs> hey, you got to remember, you got to remember this all started, one of the pieces of your uh, historical sort of uh, comparisons that, that is sort of been left out, and most people aren't aware of this, this really all started because academia became completely overtaken by post-structuralism. And the core feature of post-structuralism is there is no truth. It's all relative. 
And totally right. I was trained, yeah, I was trained that the the goal is to use this limited instrument that we have to do our best with an evidence-based exper experimentation to ascend to something approximating the truth, that the truth is worthwhile, that our goal is the truth, we can never get there, you know, it's really, there probably isn't, maybe there isn't even a truth, but we can get, we can approximate the truth. Uh, and that is our goal always. And if you start from a place where there is no truth, then any everything's on the table, any and everything's really? and and everything's off the table simultaneously. You can do, you can right. justify anything, uh, and that's. Uh, I really think the return to the pursuit of truth is a crucial. We can be wrong in our pursuit of the truth, and we can disagree in our pursuit of the truth, but at least we're trying to get to the same place. And it is time that we return to that, it seems to me. You're here. Standing ovation. I mean, I, yes. All right. Uh, well said. Beautifully All right. said. All right. Uh, Susan wants to come in. Hold on. No, I'm good. <laughs> I saw her leaning in <laughs> like she had something important to say. And then, fine. He, he does that a lot, though, Naomi. It's kind of sexy, isn't it? I do what a lot. I I, I talk about post structuralism <laughs> with disdain. Well, it's very <laughs> you inspiring. You like it when I shit on post structuralism. Very inspiring. When I, when I shit on, <laughs> well, I shit on Chaucer and uh, <laughs> Derrida. <laughs> that, that, that's really what they, gets they you deserve, going. <laughs> they deserve your contempt. Yeah, they I know. definitely do. Yeah. No, I know. Right. Listen, Foucault got my attention. Foucault got my attention many years ago when he uh, he insisted that. Um, when people adopted his point of view that mental illness was caused by institution, that there was no such thing as mental illness. I, I was so blown away that people could believe that bullshit. And then I started looking closer at all the bullshit that the, and then I started listening to French philosophers who were gobsmacked that the U S had any interest in these philosophers that they had dismissed 75 years ago <laughs> as unimportant and worthless. And we were completely taken by them. But then I thought, Oh, well, think about it this way. We are still dealing with the fact that Ken Kesey's one flew over the cuckoo's nest was written three quarters of a century ago. And yet people still think that A, that was some sort of documentary and B, that is somehow how mental health services are rendered today mm -hmm. coming in on a hundred years later. You don't think medicine has gotten a little better since then? It's quite a bit better, quite a bit better, I have to tell you. Okay, okay so we'll leave it there, Naomi. Uh, although we have weaknesses that have been uh, sort of brought out by the COVID uh, pandemic, we, we'll sort of, I guess, struggle with those weaknesses uh, while we... We suffer. Okay. <laughs> we we, we uh, will where else all prevail. <laughs> yes. We where, prevail. We, uh, where else besides uh, dailyclout.io? Uh, please, uh, you can order book. Facing the Beast on Amazon or at Chelsea Green. You can come to dailyclout.io. All of the Pfizer reports are free on the upper right-hand corner there, or you can order it in book form on Amazon. And you can come to my Substack, Outspoken, on Substack. And then Facing the Beast. Based on the beach, courage, faith, and resistance in a new dark age. Naomi Wolf, hope to see you soon. Give our best to Brian. Thank you so Please. Much. I will. Thank you, Susan. Thank okay. you, Dr. Drew. Bye-bye. You got it. And then, Caleb, uh, just one more time on the schedule coming up there. Also, we have to make an announcement. Oh. You're going to be on Russell Brand's show oh, tomorrow. Yeah. At, oh, yeah. Yeah. Does, does they that moved go live? It, they moved it to 740 for your hit time. That's much and better. And they're on Rumble. He's on YouTube. Okay. It's live, I do believe. Okay. And um, okay. I, you know, I should have thought of this in advance and made a little promotion for it. So everybody, ah. tell everybody to watch that likes him and likes Drew. I don't know what we're talking about. Are they, I don't are they give us topics? Okay. Well, Russell, Russell and I used to talk about addiction together, uh, and now here he, we are. He'll probably give you like five minutes. I don't yeah. know. Wait, who knows? I, I think maybe there were some talking points. I just have to go back in my emails. Fair enough. I was sick this week. I completely forgot. Uh, so here we go. There's that upcoming schedule. Stan Hope tomorrow, Brewer on uh, next Tuesday, Joseph Latipo. Uh, Willie Soon is in, I'm not much familiar with uh, Dr. Soon. Roseanne, Alex Barrens, and Kelly Victor comes back on uh, Valentine's Day. So we will see you then. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. 
I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.